Hello, Brett Etheridge here, founder of Dominate Test Prep and the industry's leading executive assessment prep course. I am glad you're here where we are going to do some practice. We're going to go through a practice question together specifically in the world of data sufficiency as it may appear for you on the executive assessment and it's going to be a harder variation right i have found that there is an appetite out there for more challenging practice questions and that's great and that's what we are going to do today but i would always caution you to make sure you can walk before you run meaning if you haven't really learned the basics the methodology understand how to eliminate answer choices how to attack data sufficiency you may not quite be ready for this and yet i'll actually teach you some really cool things and a good approach for these types of questions and you will get a sense of how to how to do data sufficiency better on the executive assessment so i'm not telling you to leave <laughs> i'm just saying if you have questions certainly you can post them in the comments area below and we'll do our best to make sure that you can answer this and other similar questions on test day. And by the way, for more practice, free practice, you can head over to dominatetestprep.com forward slash what's on the EA. We have a free six question quiz, a practice quiz, a practice assessment for you to try your hand at some of the different question types. And we have detailed video answer explanations for all of those questions as well to help you learn some things as you prepare for the executive assessment. But without Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at this sample question. So here's the data sufficiency question. The question stem is very clearly asking, what is the tens digit of n? Well, I don't know. What is n? It's a variable. Okay, fine. We are told that n is a positive integer. File that away. And then you have your two statements. Go ahead and press pause. I'll give you a second to try it on your own and then we'll come back and talk about it together. Go ahead and press pause. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive in. How did you do? You feel good about it? Do you have the right answer? I'll leave you in suspense for a moment, but any time, and so here's kind of the very first tip, right? Why is this a challenging question? And, and you might not have felt like it was overly, overly challenging. Some of you though might really kind of be struggling with it. And the reason this would be considered a, an above average difficulty question is because we're dealing with variables. We're dealing in the abstract, like n. What does n mean in the tens digit of n? And there are a few moving parts here that would make this more challenging. By the way, you have to know what the tens digit is, right? And obviously if we have a three digit number, so let's just go back to the basics. Sometimes we need to brush off our math cobwebs and even remember what this means. Like if I have the number 326 or whatever, right? The six is the units digit or the ones digit. And then the two would be the tens digit. And then the three would be the hundreds digit and so forth. So that's just kind of, well, I'll leave that up there so you can reference that. So we're, we're really kind of wondering what is that tens digit? And it's probably not two. And by the way, we actually don't even care what it is. We just need to know, could we find it? What is it? Can I definitively find it? If I can, then a statement is sufficient. So that's the first thing to file away. The second thing is anytime I'm dealing in the abstract with ends, we can make it easier by thinking about real numbers. Let's work with some real numbers. And specifically, you know, I just want you to use your scratch paper. I always tell my students in my course, he or she who uses the most scratch paper wins. And so don't be afraid to actually write stuff down. And in this case, I want to write down the world of possible ends. That's the way I like to think about it. Like what are all of the possible ends that satisfy this information? So I'm going to evaluate statement number one. What type of ends are there such that when I multiply it by 10, the hundreds digit is six? Well, how is that going to happen? Could n equal one, for example? Like we're told that n is positive in the original question. What if n is one? Well, then one times 10, so like 10n in that case, is 10. Uh-oh, nope. Not only is the hundreds digit not six, there's not even a hundreds digit. It doesn't get big enough. It's only a two digit number. Ah, okay, light bulbs are starting to come on. So I need at least a two digit number for n, like 10, 
to create a three digit number when I multiply by 10. Okay, so I'm getting somewhere. Do you see, see how this works? You're just sort of moving the ball down the field by trying to figure out the possible world of n's. n can't be one. That's just not an allowable value of n. n might be able to be 10 because 10 times 10 is 100. Okay, Ooh, well, is that possible? No, because I'm told that, okay, it is a three digit number, but the hundreds digit is not six. The hundreds digit needs to be six. So n can't be 10. So what type of number must n be? Ah, how about 60? So n could definitely be 60 because 60 times 10 creates a number 600 where the hundreds digit is six. Now we're getting somewhere. What else could n be? What are the possible worlds of n? Well, n could be 61, because then 10n would be 610. n could be 62, because then the 10n would be 620, and so forth, right? All the way down to 69, because then 10n would be 690, and the hundreds digit remains six every time. So like these are the possible worlds of N. By the way, it couldn't be 70 because the second I get to 70, 70 times n would be 700. Now the hundreds digit is no longer 6, right? So 70 is not an allowable value of n. Now here's where it gets tricky. Given that world of possible n's, can I definitively answer the question? Be careful. Some students would look at this and say, well, Brett, no, the tens digit is different every time, right? One, two, nine. I, so I don't definitively know n. It's not sufficient. Not so fast. The question isn't asking what is the tens digit of 10n. It's asking what is the tens digit of n itself and in every possible case. Every possible potential n in the world of allowable n's according to statement number one, it is six. Definitively. It will be the same every time. Six, 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 like all the way down. Therefore, I definitively know what n is, or the tens digit of n is, according to statement number one. So statement one is actually sufficient. Well done if you got that, right? So, Again, part of what makes it challenging, lots of moving parts here. You've got ends and 10 ends, and so you have to stay organized. And the best way to stay organized, I like to make columns on my scratch paper and write out the different possibilities and confirm that yes, the tens digit of n will be the same all the time. So now we can get rid of B, C, and E. By the way, if you don't understand why, that's just second nature. You have to understand the methodology of data sufficiency. Don't have time to go into all of that now. And now we simply evaluate statement number two in isolation. Forgetting that we ever saw this information and we're just evaluating statement number two by itself, I'll use a different pen color for that, but we wanna do the exact same thing. According to the information in statement two, what are the, what's the world of allowable ends? Where when I add one, the tens digit is seven. Again, could n be one? No, because n plus one, would be two. Well, not only is does that not equal seven, it doesn't even have a tens digit because it's not a two digit number, so fine, n can't be one. Uh, so now we're starting to realize, okay, it's gotta be a two digit number or like nine, it could be nine because nine plus one is 10, that's at least a two digit number, but the tens digit is not seven, it's only one, so that's not gonna work. What if n is 10, 10 plus one is 11. Tens digit is not seven. Ah, okay, to get all the way up to a tens digit of seven, I need like numbers in the 70s. 70 plus one is 71. Yep, 10, tens digit is seven. We're good to go. So it can't be 10. I'll erase that so we don't distract you. It can't be nine. Those are not allowable values of n, but it could be 70. Could be 71. Could be 72. Right, Because in all cases, when I add one, 72, 73, the tens digit is seven. So these are allowable values of n. And we would go all the way up to 79? No, because at 79, when I add one, it gets to 80. 
the tens digit is no longer seven. So 79 is not an allowable value of n. You know, we could go all the way up to 78. So is that enough to answer the question? Certainly looks like the tens digit is seven all the time, but what are we missing? What makes this a hard question? We need to make play devil's advocate and realize that there's actually another possible value of n, 69, such that when I add one to it, it becomes 70. The tens digit of n plus one is in fact seven, and yet n itself only has a tens digit of six, so now I have conflicting outcomes. I have some values of n for which the tens digit is seven, and one value of n for which the tens digit is six, because I don't definitively know whether the answer to the question is six or seven, I do not have enough information to definitively answer the question not sufficient. Therefore, the correct answer is answer choice A. So, however long it's taken me to explain this, well done if all the way back at the beginning you already had the right answer. <laughs> uh, but hopefully you learned something about the methodology, about the best way of attacking questions like this, about how to stay organized on your scratch paper, and you can turn an otherwise challenging question and make it a lot easier, again, by trying to work with some real numbers, systematically writing stuff out on your scratch paper. And if you did find this challenging, and maybe you didn't get it right on your own, hopefully you now see how to get it right. So hopefully this has empowered you to answer these types of questions at least. Certainly there's a whole larger world of data sufficiency questions, not all of which involve variables, for example, different, you know, again, variations that you certainly need to practice and learn to do well on data sufficiency across the board. But for this type of question, hopefully you benefited from this explanation of a fairly challenging data sufficiency question. Again, head over to dominatetestprep.com, both for our free quiz and if you want to sign up for one of our comprehensive prep courses so that you can dominate the executive assessment. I'll either see you on the inside or perhaps on a future video here on YouTube. Questions, comments, leave them below. Click that subscribe button so you get alerted when we post future potential questions like this or other tips, tricks, and strategies. For now, I am signing off. Take care, everyone.